We're back. All right. At uh, Affinity Extra. You know it's the best radio station. It's time for you to end the other extra stations and come to this one and get your children wrapped up in this because we know we are going somewhere. We are in critical thinking here in uh, uh, Rock Solid and we're in the Justice Reboot. And my guest this week is the Reverend Dr. Carver Anderson. We're so blessed, we're so privileged, and we're in the second part of our conversation. Now we're moving into your theological journey now, Dr. Carver. So we've talked about where you come from, so people know that you're not just been sitting in Little Aston, drinking Chianti with your neighbors, <laughs> and then pretending that you come down to help the colored folk. You were there in the midst of it. And, and this is what I think that theology is, when you get in the mud, you know, um, Cornel West talks about in the funk of the world. And he means that you've got to get dirty if you want to be where Christ was because Christ was in the dirt with the people and he lifted them out of the dirt. But to be where they are, you're going to have to get splashed a little bit. Come on. And so he talks about that. I think James Cohn does the same thing. He says that if there's no practical evidence of your theology, then your theology is inept. Indeed. So let's have a look now. Now, you and I have been reading um, a good amount of James Cohn, but we've also read a number of theologians al alongside that. And, and I think it's important for us to get a British perspective as well. Um, big shout out to uh, Professor Robert Beckford, who's been working and theologically developing Definitely. his work for a while. So yes. we've got textbook there from this country. And we've also got Dr. Anthony Reddy as That's well, right. who's right. the leading exponent. And there are some coming through as well. And we're looking forward to your book as well. Doctor, uh, well, can I Carver. just? Yeah. yeah. So, talk to us about your theological development now, and how has that now impacted how you practice? Because you've put you put it, you put it on the line here. Of course. You, you, you know, your, your bread and butter is doing praxis. You That's know, right. doing theology. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, let me just deal with the book first. I've, I, I refuse to do a book because yes. at this point, yes. Um, so I've done many chapters of many books in relation to my theology. Now, what is my theology? That's the question. And how have I taken this theological journey? Theology for me is how I work out God's perspective, God's gaze on the society that is broken, that is impoverished, that is struggling. And I say that Yahshua is in me. Now, as a black man who's been through crisis in school, in community, how does Jesus relate to my everyday life and my live, lived experience? So I took many years at Birmingham University to emerge and thank again, Professor Beckford who started with me and also um, Professor um, Lati. Mm -hmm. Now, these men started off with me mm -hmm. and I then had two professors and there were white professors after that. Mm -hmm. and one is a leading practical theologian, okay. um, Stephen Patterson and yeah. <clears throat> another, um, Werner Eustroff. Now, I then started looking inside, Carver, what does your faith mean as a black man in relation to every space on this planet that you occupy and looking at your ancestors and how they've been impacted, the whole issue about slavery, oppression, the hostile environment, how have you dealt with this in your everyday life, mm. Carver Anderson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my theology is not just practical theology, but I'm a public theologian and I'm a social scientist. So I've used interdisciplinary tools, criminology, psychology, I've used anthropology to make sense of my theology. It means, therefore, that when I did research, I'm an ethnographer. Mm -hmm. I spent many years in the trenches, okay, yeah. seeing and feeling the pain of men and women, doing things that other people probably wouldn't do, being there when my life has been at risk. Doing So my theology emerges out of mm. pain, Mm. and engagement with pain mm -hmm. but i relate it to the bible right. i go what jesus <clears throat> excuse me jesus christ said <clears throat> excuse me when he said the spirit of the lord is upon me mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. i'm anointed so my theology is public also public mm -hmm. theology is a theology that engages with other groups 
for the public good of human welfare and human well-being. Mm -hmm. So when I go to the mosque or to the temple or the Gurdwara, I do talk to people mm -hmm. in relation to where, what can you bring? So is everyone in the faith tradition, got, have they got a treasure chest? Okay, yeah. Care, compassion, love, insight, humility. I would talk to them. Mm -hmm. But I am a driver in black liberation theology. One of the leading books, you know, that I read is a book called In the Company of the Poor by Gustavo Gutierrez yes. and mm -hmm. also Paul Farmer. Mm -hmm. And what they did, one is a medical doctor. Mm. And he's the other one a priest? And is the priest? other one is a priest. Okay. Gutierrez. Yeah, Gutierrez. And together yeah. they came and mm. said, we want to be in the company of the poor. Now imagine if all leaders said, we want to be in the company of community where brokenness is. Because some of the people that we are talking about, they're not coming to our churches. They may come for a funeral or a dedication and that's it. How do we ensure that what we say, what we do, and how we go out is relevant to mm. them. Mm -hmm. So my theology is about that. So all the books I've read and mm -hmm. chapters I've written, this here mm -hmm. in 2002 was talking about a relevant church. Right, I yes. said there, if you're going to have a relevant church, you've got to take an assessment of the communities that you're in to know what they feel, what they think, and how they respond to pain and anguish. Mm. And I believe that there needs to be more theologians and theological thinking okay. that is critical about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think definitely that's, that's kind of the nuggets that we needed to hear that for theology to be real to people, if we're talking about critical theology, um, and black theology and liberation theology is that critical theology because it speaks about the oppressed. And um, Jesus had much to say. Hallelujah. 66 books Hallelujah. Uh, are in him, right? Uh, we talk about the written canon text, very minor amount of information that is coming out of Christ. So when you think about every subject matter that the anointed saviour had to deal with, the first thing he enters his ministry with is the spirit of the Hallelujah. Lord God is upon him. Hallelujah. Because that is it for him. Come on. Yeah? Because he hath anointed me to deal with the oppressed. And so when we look at our theological praxis and, and, and how we get about it, that's why I wrote about covenant theology, but yes. in the heart of it is about liberation and, and, and black theology. Yes. It's about the praxis of God saying to the church, you are here to deliver or to help, to lift, to transform the lives of the oppressed. And you must remember that the journey that they, have, they take is a, is a holy journey and their needs are holy. And I think that that's so important for us to understand that the oppressed needs are holy and, and therefore we have to focus on them. And you're mm -hmm. right. Um, Jonathan, the thing, all those oppressive structures and mm. principalities and powers need you to engage with whatever is oppressing it through the politics, through sociology, through psychology. We cannot deal with oppressive issues without dealing with the drivers of them. Mm. We can pray all day. Right. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. All night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if we do not go to the politicians who are making the rules, the regulations, the policies, mm -hmm. the structures, the subtexts, yes. then we are not going to be engaging with what Jesus says right. to be anointed and in the spirit and to do something yes. about it. Amen. I think, I think it's so critical. So let's wind things forward now. And we don't want to wind them too far forward because I want a separate conversation about this. So now, you've now birthed this idea of a gathering. And that's wrapped around the conversations that you've been having about bringing hope. And that was also informed by your theological journey when we talk about um, uh, uh, black theology and black power to liberate and to lift. And when we talk about the context of uh, James Cone, looking at this context of, um, they say uh, there, there is white supremacy and black supremacy. This is the conversation in academia in the early days. But they say this, black supremacy has never been in a position to, uh, to impose its 
rites or its deliberations amongst the congregations or the people, if you like. Yeah, if you if you get what I'm saying, they've never been in a position of power to harm any lives or to oppress anybody. However, white supremacy has been in a position to oppress. So therefore, the context of black power and black theology is readdressing this whiteness as a supremacy that has now uh, affected your life, my life, and the people that we deal with, but also the white poor. You know, Dr. King talks about if the white poor would understand that they are as bad or they are in, are in as bad a position as the black poor, they would walk with them on their journey of liberation. So you're getting into this space now, bringing hope. What is this about, Tom? Well, I mm -hmm. must give a shout out to my, my dear friend, um, Reverend Robin Thompson, who mm -hmm. we are founders of the Bringing Hope charity. Right. And Bringing Hope really is creating the space where we become relevant voices, arms, love, care, compassion to the community who are on church, who are disconnected from the church. What does this mean? Mm. It means that we will create something out of the box. The gathering will be out of the box. So I know people now, come as you are, we say come as you are. The woman at the well came as she was, didn't right, she? Right, yes. And after Jesus spoke to her, she went and said to the people, come see a man that told me. I want people in the community to say, come see a place where we can be empowered even though I'm still burning my spliff at this point and I mm. want to stop burning the spliff even <laughs> though I'm still cussing and I want to stop cussing even though I'm still doing what I'm doing and I don't want to stop doing that but they're not judging me in this place here they're taking me along and and each of this will start falling off me you know mm. so I don't want it to fall off people for it to fall off before they come I want it to that to come and it fall off as they come right. so bringing hope is about that space right yeah bringing hope and the gathering is about creating that um, spiritual, theological, compassionate chamber mm. where anybody comes in, no matter where they're from, what they're doing. And please note this, mm -hmm. it's not a black thing. Right, and I yes. want to say that really important because yes. when Yeshua said the spiritual laws upon me, it's not just for black flesh or white flesh, even though there's a um, default to people who are oppressed like ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Yeshua said it's for everybody. Yes. Yeah. God's John 3, 16, one of the texts in the Bible mm -hmm. is for God's so love that he gave for everybody right yes. so bringing hope is about engaging with individuals and families who are broken marginalized involved in criminality crime violence or whatever issues and we're saying here we want to bring hope why because of our faith in yashua mm -hmm. because of our trust and because carver anderson is saying the spirit of the lord is upon me because i'm anointed to engage and do something, Amen. not just talk it. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that just uh, is enough to, for people to understand that this is how uh, theology informs us and engages uh, us Hallelujah. to do. Uh, because it's more than just theoretical. It takes you beyond the textbook and it takes you to where the rubber meets the road, we used to say in our classes, where the rubber meets the road. And where the rubber meets the road is where the crisis is. And every time you look at Christocentric text, Jesus is always where the crisis is. He's never running away from it. So the next part is um, there are new theologians writing. And one of the new theologians writing is Eric Mason. And in his book, Urban Apologetics, he writes about restoring black dignity. So I would put that to you, Carver. Do you think the community has lost its dignity? What is your opinion of this? Firstly, my dignity is in Yeshua. Uh -huh. So nobody can tell me that I'm not a man of integrity and dignity. However, mm -hmm. socio-political understanding of dignity is that we have a community that is struggling to represent themselves because of the glass ceilings and so on. Mm -hmm. But because my dignity 
is rooted somewhere else. And I believe that the black community is struggling at this point in time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Jonathan. I believe that there are some issues that are pertinent. Youth, unemployment, crime, criminality, poverty, issues of underachievement, that is still there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So dignity, the notion of dignity is something to do with our self-worth, mm -hmm. our liberation, our ability to be self-sustained. Mm -hmm. And we're not there with all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the church possibly is one of the most um, embedded institutions in the community, but okay. then it struggles mm -hmm. with the total connectivity of the pain and the anguish that's there. Yeah. And I think we could help with the public theology perspective to raise what Yeshua said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I'm going to engage with those things that literally reaffirms dignity, mm. really. Amen. Thank you so much, Carver. We want to just recommend to you a number of uh, um, um, scholars. Carver, who, which scholar makes you want to throw the book through the window when you read it? Which scholar has challenged you most? Uh, what do you mean challenge? Me? Yeah, just challenge your theology and kind of changed it. A number, as I said, the books are, you know... Yeah. But if you were to pick one favourite text... I can't pick a favourite. You can't pick a favourite? I can't pick a favourite. That's because an academic it, for you. <laughs> no, because there's an interdisciplinary yes. model here yes. for me. Yeah. And there's no one text. And I would not want people to say, well, Carver's text is a leading text, even yes, though yes. I may be a, a, a pioneer. I would want to say we have an interdisciplinary approach. Yes. Here you have Dale Andrews, which right. talks about black practical theology. You have Gustavo Gutierrez here. Uh -huh. You have... Um, now, this one here challenged yeah, me, Jamie if I'm Cone. honest with you. Yep. James Cone, the cross and the lynching tree. Yes. Because remember our history? Listen, family friends, mm -hmm. if you read about our history deeply, mm -hmm. the book breaking, yes. the lynchings, believe mm -hmm. me, the songs about our lynching, we used to have open forums for people to come and see how our ancestors were lynched. And that challenged me. That This book made me cry. Yes. This one yeah. made me cry, right. Jonathan. Yeah. I think that exactly that. This made me cry. It did. did. Well, there you because are. the narrative was there and I'm huh. frightened to read a bigger narrative because the bigger narrative is a pictorial evidence uh, like postcards of black people, black Come on. Um, Americans and some Caribbeans. Uh, they don't even have documentation of how bad they treated the Caribbeans. So the Americans had more pictorial. But when they show you all of the pictures of the lynched men and women, women burned, babies cut out of the belly, I so cried. and so forth, it makes you wonder. That, that is the radical question. And, we're, and, and I'm hopefully going to do a bigger conversation about does God love or hate us? Because we, we do ask that question when we start walking through history. So um, I want us to understand this because some people feel like God hates us because of this situation and allowing those people to be able to take advantage of us. However, that's for another conversation. So we go back to again to kind of reflect upon the dignity of us to say, I totally agree with what you're saying. That one, your dignity needs to be in Christ, but at the same time, you need to grab your own positioning to say, I will live in my dignity. And I think that's what the Caribbean showed us. I think that's what the Jamaicans, the Kittitians, the Barbadians showed us. That no matter what they think, we are dignified within ourselves. Hallelujah. You know, we used to talk in church about our shame plate will never be broken. We will always keep our dignity. So as we finalize our uh, thoughts, I thought that it was important for us to understand the, the, the concept of looking at how other theologians, I think one of the big ones that hit me, small book, small book. It was, what color was Jesus? Yeah. And this is by William Mosley. It's a very small book, oh. but it radicalized my understanding oh. Oh. of the images that pushed me away from being connected to God. So our next conversation is we're, we're, uh, about our black Jesus. Okay. But, we, but, but that's going to be a, a nice long one. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I'm, so, I'm there. <laughs> so, so, so in the present context, what are your, what, what are your final words to the rock solid 
uh, crew and to this Justice Reboot today in reflection of, I'll tell you one thing, in, in reflection of, say, like the Windrush kind of thing, the name that was given to a group of people who came from the Caribbean, very small group, it's very neat, it's very tidy. But in the outset of Windrush, it was wrapped around a scandal. So have you noticed how the word scandal has been taken off and now it's been celebrated? I'm asking myself, how much did that uh, statue cost? And could perhaps the money from that statue have been given to the people who have not got that compensation yet? <laughs> so what do you think about that as a final conversation? My final thing, you know, yeah. Jonathan, is a, is a simple prayer yes. that I want to give today uh -huh. to my listener. Uh -huh. With all of that there, the scandal. I'm from the Caribbean, so I'm categorized as a winner. I had to buy my citizenship. Yes. So I'm one of those, aren't I? You know, yes, still yeah. got my certificate and my number like a like a slave, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. And I want to just pray for everyone who's going through something in about 30 seconds. That's what I want to leave uh -huh. to say that that disturbs me, that whole conversation disturbs mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. But I want to say to you today who are listening that I confirm that the power of Jesus Christ is upon us right now. And I pray for your mind, your thoughts, your liberation. I confirm that the Lord has already liberated us and we need to walk in that liberation as black men, women, and families, you are liberated. Let nothing intimidate us. That's what David says, the spirit of the Lord. I'm sorry, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my servant. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of our life. We don't have to fear. So I'm saying to you today, it's been great being with Bishop Jonathan Jackson and also um, Roger Moore. So I'm really blessed to be here today. And I say that our dignity, our liberation, is rooted in the liberated Lord. So that's all I want to say to you today. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Carver Anderson. You've been on Affinity Extra, on the Rock Solid Show, on our, what would you call it, our Justice Reboot. We are looking to bring you into the theological bowl. We are opening up the doors of academia and we are going places where you've never been allowed before. And God willing, we shall take you on a journey where you understand yourself and the greatness of what God has put in you, that you can stand on the world stage, just like Marcus Garvey said, and that you people must rise up, rise up, ye mighty people. God bless you. This is Affinity Extra with the Rock Solid Reboot with Dr. Carver Anderson, my big brother, <laughs> not so much bigger, <laughs> and uh, myself, Bishop Jonathan Jackson. God bless you. Take care until I speak to you again on Rock Solid. Thank you for listening to this content. If you liked it, please don't forget to like, subscribe and make a comment down below. Or even more so, check out our website www.affinityextra.com for more information.